We're now about to dive into the next engaging discussion where we're going to explore the ethical and safety implications of AI. I was gonna ask that question, but I said, oh, the next panel is gonna answer it for me. First up is Rylan Rogers, who serves on Microsoft's accessibility team as a disability policy advisor. Rylan's mission is to drive change in disability policy across the realms of technology, workforce, and fundamental rights. Her work is deeply influenced by her own experiences with disability as a dyslexic individual with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis and as a mother of two young adults with physical disabilities and medical complexity. Rylan and her family are all in when it comes to championing disability policy. Joining her is Dr. Sarah Basson. She is a dedicated champion at Google, committed to empowering people with disabilities in emerging markets. In her previous role as disability inclusion lead, she spearheaded initiatives to enhance inclusivity within Google and make technology more accessible and user-friendly through education and advocacy for accessibility. Dr. Basson is also an active member of the Board of Directors for institutions like the Lexington School for the Deaf, Enable Africa, and Meals on Wheels of White Plains. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Kelly Grillo. I met Kelly a little earlier, an award-winning educator with over two decades of dedicated service to special education and educational justice. Currently, Dr. Grillo holds the position of Special Education Director at the Northwest Hendricks School Corporation in Indiana. She's also the managing owner of TBD Partners, a technology solutions company that specializes in providing access design for learners. Beyond her professional roles, Dr. Grillo is an active volunteer on numerous boards, and she currently serves as the president of the International Dyslexia Association Indiana branch. Let's extend a warm and enthusiastic welcome to our esteemed panelists as they join us for this very spirited discussion. So I'm back. <laughs> yeah, but I don't have to do another introduction. So I think we have more time, hopefully, to engage our fine panelists here. Uh, maybe just, we had wonderful introductions, but maybe you want to introduce yourself a little bit and kind of what you're bringing to the table and what you're thinking about as you're kind of approaching the stage and, and, and the conversations we've had over the last 24 hours. So I'm Rylan Rogers, and um, I love disability policy. It's who I am, it's what I am, it's my hobby, it's my life, I have no boundaries. Um, <laughs> and what I think about and what I bring to this conversation is what we started to talk about right now, which is what do we do? And how do we do this in a way that creates equity, that addresses the realities of what's missing in our society, and from my perspective, how do we do it in a way that accelerates the talent of people with disabilities and brings everyone into our economies and our communities? And what keeps me up at night is there's so much potential and so much risk. And the other part about it that um, I'm challenged by is that we're not at the table. We mentioned that there were two pieces in the executive order. Uh, Senator Schumer has had a series of roundtables on um, AI policy, and he has not included the disability community. The UK just hosted a major international convention. There was not one single word spoken about accessibility or disability. So the time is now to get at the table and get involved and really think about how do we make sure that we are unleashing an acceleration in opportunity and that we're doing it in a way that um, changes the harms of our society as we know it and moves us forward. Great. Um, <clears throat> so I'm uh, Sarah Bassan, as, as introduced. I'm at Google and uh, focusing on accessibility and disability inclusion. Uh, currently, my major focus and passion with no boundaries is accessibility and disability inclusion in emerging markets. So how do we bring some of the know-how that we have here uh, in the West um, where, uh, indeed, with all the gaps, we are extremely privileged and making more of it available, uh, you know, sharing some of this know-how and capability in uh, underserved markets, which are most of the world. Um, uh, I got into this space with uh, a background in speech pathology and audiology, discovered I was really not a very good clinician. I was young and ambitious, and I wanted 
aphasics to be speaking, and they weren't. Um, <laughs> And so went on to do a, a PhD, veered towards uh, speech science, miraculously ended up, this is not a strategy. Um, somebody came to the Graduate Center, which was across the street where I was doing my PhD, looking for somebody who knew phonetics to work in text-to-speech synthesis at IBM Research. And it's like, wow, there are jobs like that. And so I ended up in the kind of industrial uh, in you know space of of research and but with his background in excess in, in speech pathology and audiology was always focusing on how do you use these technologies for the greater good of people with disabilities how do you create captioning we're going back some time captioning opportunities for students who are deaf and hard of hearing in university and so on so I've always sort of straddled the speech technology and disability space and um, uh, so actually, this whole idea of AI and uh, you know disability is really kind of my spe sweet spot because I've worked in speech recognition. So that, believe it or not, is an AI also, you know, way preceding um, you know the ChatGPT world, and um, also very focused on disability. And so delighted to be here. It's really a privilege to meet you all, and looking forward to input from all of you about what Google could be doing more uh, and better um, in the field of learning disabilities. I'm glad I'm sitting next to her because I have a very long list for those of you that are also like me, someone who relies on text-to-speech and technologies. Um, daily, I use these technologies. And when we talk about schools, we are creating marginalized societies in our public K-12 schools because we strip the students like me with disabilities away from these technologies in the name of safety. So unlike many of the folks that you've heard today, I'm gonna to be the adversary of that conversation, not because I'm trying to poke the bear, but because I see the inequities as a special education director and social so services coordinator who is also disabled in the space. So Google technology for a long time has been giving translation services. They've been doing very quickly what people like me need in time without advanced planning for, for our accommodations. Um, if I was a person that was needing um, transcription today, we could easily take anything in your pocket and transcribe. I also am back in school for deaf education, uh, another graduate degree, why? I'm, I'm a lifelong learning, learner apparently. But um, I want to serve my students in my district greater to be able to have access. And if I create access for the one and two percent, we're raising the basement to reach and push the ceiling. And it's for all kids. And it is fundamentally a civil right. And when we get that right in our schools, we're getting that right better in society. Where I think we need to pivot the conversation is empowering the individual. And we have to be really careful when we start to get into these bodies that govern and legislate the changes because it's taking away the power of the individuals to be in the conversation. A perfect example is the FCC and avionics and lots of spaces that people were in before we started to create licensure programming. Licensure programming is a really easy way to divide and only have the giants like Google at the table. So if we're really talking equity, we're going to keep some of these platforms open so every single one of us can have a place at the table. So my, my perspective is way different, but I've had a very different journey than Jamie. I uh, was out with my disability very early in my PhD studies because when I hide my difference, it creates big problems and then I'm no longer at the table. So when I use the power and the protections of civil rights in my corner, I have a seat at the table. So it's a very different perspective. It's one that makes people very uncomfortable when they also are not the disabled and they are not the person in need of the protections. So um, I hope that I can add to the conversation in a way that is palatable and that we are not dividing further. And I would 
would welcome any one of you to have my personal cell phone number and call me and have this discussion because this is the only thing I talk about. Um, having a company called Technology by Design, I've gotten to meet people from all over the country, all over the world, who have shared open source, really cool data, and they've given to me freely because of who I am as a person with a disability to make sure that I can keep sharing this and giving it also away freely. So I do believe in the open source background of what we do in disabilities and in the science of what we're doing because it's going to open up access to those that are greatly marginalized. Wow. <laughs> Incredible, right? I think we just go home. Um, <laughs> So, you know, some of the questions we had at the beginning were really around implementation in schools, which we really appreciated. I'm sure we're going to get more if we opened it up to the rest of the floor. But, I mean, in some way, you're all working on implementation in schools just at different levels. Let's start off with thinking about on-the-ground implementation and what that means when we think about artificial intelligence and what's going on in schools. And then maybe if you could bring it over to how do we... How do we support the collaboration with, with companies, whether they're open companies or whether they're large behemoth companies? Which, by the way, I want to clarify, I'm assuming it's, it goes without saying, but I'm, I'm guessing most people, everyone on the panel, both panels are speaking for themselves and not on behalf of their organiz organization, I would guess, unless declared otherwise. Yeah, and that said, Google is a very open company. <laughs> so maybe we could start off by talking about what's happening on the ground within your district or other districts you're working with. And well, so within the district setting, AI is really not at the table. I, I would say that most people don't understand it. They're thinking it's this thing just in Forbes magazine and you know on major popular news channels. They really only think it is chat GPT. They don't understand the implications. They don't even understand that we've been using it for the last 50 years. So. Um, recently, Google has changed some of their protection policies. So in every school district, there is a technology integration plan. There's someone in your districts at the local level that is responsible for the IT implementation, the sciences behind keeping your children safe in your network system. So there's lots of rules. Most of you don't know those rules. Some of the kids will know the rules in the handbook because they know what they're not allowed to search during math class. But in terms of the rules, they're willing to break them. And as a person with a disability, I break the rules. So I am just talking as Kelly Grillo right now. I break the rules within my infrastructure to increase access. And I sometimes talk with my boss and I share with him that I'm encouraging some children in our infrastructure, with their parents' consent, of course, to also break some of those rules. Because to be competitive in an AP class or to be competitive in certain venue, you need to be able to break some rules to get some academic advantages. And so I do this in a way that is a push and a pull, the yin and the yang. But as a director, I'm also a part of those teams, and I'm leading our IT teams. And I understand the language, and I have that cross-sectional understanding of what this means for a real teacher who doesn't understand any of it, because your teachers don't understand it. Most of our teachers are like, what, Texas Beach, what? Can they go to the resource room for that? They don't understand it. They think an assistive technologist is gonna swoop in like a fairy and fix it all. And so if it's not written into your child's IEP and there's not somebody in that system that knows how to do these things, it's not getting done. I'm just sharing that with you. It's not getting done if you're not actually asking for it. And you're following up to ask about the logs and the actual sessions that are happening. So we tend to say that the IEP governs our, our teams to put in assistive technology and tools and that the system has a response, but it really doesn't until we actually come to the table and ask. And so everybody trying to figure this out together, it takes somebody like me that's also disabled that says, hey, I need that. 
hey, I need that, hey, I need that, until the conversations actually get real and it levitates off of the paper and it's not just a part of a strategic plan or on a shelf somewhere. And so it's really important to make the work about the individuals and not about the policy. So I'll echo that because we heard that in the last panel. And so when we start to look at what the unique need is and those learning objectives and think about how to bridge that gap, the rules will not be so tight and we will be flexibly living in this space and then we'll take the actual safety protocols to the learner and we'll start to teach the learner how to make really good judgments about what they're sharing and how they're getting their needs met in a system with the, with the technology in their pocket. Just for fun, I'm gonna share a little piece of technology. All of you have um, phones and smartphones, so there's a fun app called Seeing IA. So S-E-E-I-N-G, I-A. It is really fun. So we're at a casual event. You can take a picture of your colleague smiling today, and it will put a subscript. It will give you an estimated age, and it will say, happy lady, 50, uh, roughly 56 years old, smiling, you know, looking happy. But it's going to read your facial expression. It's using IA. So for some of my students that are not good at predicting emotion, they can take a picture in a setting and understand the climate, what's happening. You know, it will also take a picture of money. So I do quite a bit of traveling. I don't know all of the conversions. So you could take a picture of money here or in another country. It will tell you how much money it is. And so you'll be able to make a better judgment if you should be spending your money well. So it, there's really nice things, but it could scan your menu and read it to you. And so if you are somebody like me that needs assistive technology all the time to best connect to print, you have a piece of assistive technology in your pocket that is free as long as you have a phone. And I know sometimes phones could be very expensive, but a lot of our schools have technology in the infrastructure and people don't even know how to use it to the benefit of a person that would need that. So just play with that. It's a lot of fun, especially if you've had a few drinks. <laughs> so as we think about, uh, obviously Microsoft and Google are on the front lines of this every day. There is some thought about how, how it's being integrated into schools. Obviously, uh, you're building AI systems, and you've been building for decades, really. Uh, what are some things that you're thinking about in that process, specifically you think about learners with disabilities, and specifically learners with learning disabilities? So I'm lucky that I get to see the things that you're all gonna see in a couple of weeks. Um, and I feel super lucky about that because I'm dyslexic. And I'm using Microsoft's new tools, which we call Copilot. And it is AI built into all the products. Um, and it's, I have to say, changed my life, which sounds weird and like a company ad. But I'm as excited about it as I was when I was a very young student, because I'm old, when WordPerfect came out. <laughs> And it had spell check. And my parents spent a lot of money because I was dyslexic. And they're like, this will be a very helpful tool to you. And when I first saw the little red squiggly line, uh, the whole page, I was like, oh, somebody sees me. They, like, I can do this. Um, so in my whole life, in all of my education, and all my professional life, I have always used a human editor. So much so I married one. I married a high school uh, English teacher. He speaks fluent Rylan. He's my editor. Um, but now, for the first time in my life, last week, I turned in a written document without an editor because I used the co-pilot. There was a short timeline. It had to go to the White House. So not like, you know, a low stakes written document. I like to go big. Um, but I needed to give them a brief on a policy that we're advocating for around um, wage equity for people with disabilities. And I needed it to happen quickly and I had lots of note pages and I asked our co-pilots to help. It did it, it was beautiful. I did ask my editor to say, do you I still need to do something? And he said, no, I'm retiring. I don't need to do anything and I turned it in. That's the kind of transformation that is possible with technology for a learner. 
it needed my skills, it needed my brain, it needed my thinking, but it was the co-pilot to unlock a new level of participation. I think there's another balance piece though, back to my worry, because you talked about seeing AI, which another Microsoft yeah. ad, it's a product. Um, but, and we talked about facial recognition, which is incredibly important for people that are neurodivergent. It's incredibly important for people who are blind. There's currently a state law in Illinois that's intended to protect privacy and protect your biometric data. And because of that, that app does not work in the state of Illinois. So it's a question now about rights and civil rights protection. We absolutely need to be super careful about facial recognition and what we're using it for. There are horrific examples of how it's being used for surveillance. At the same time, we need to protect the rights for accessibility for people with disabilities. And that's gonna be a big tension piece. What about Google? Yeah, so um, you know, we've been uh, focusing a lot on AI fairness and disability. Um, and actually there was an interesting discussion about you know, when we think about AI fairness, uh, you know, uh, we're probably thinking about, you know, are, are the you know, people represented in the databases and so on, and I'll get to that in a second. Um, but there are also these issues like, um, you, know, uh, you know, when you ask a system, show me images of people with disabilities, and it understands you perfectly well, but what it shows are, you know, horrific examples. They're not capturing the broad swath of disability and certainly not capturing invisible disability. So just something to think about um, in terms of building into these systems and making sure that they, that they are fair. So AI and accessibility has a lot of dimensions. Um, and then the other issue that is talked about a lot is, um, you know, does AI bring us to a state of complete objectivity because now we don't have humans, we have machines making the decision. Uh, well, no, the issue there is the machines are being created by humans, and so our intrinsic biases get in there. They get into the algorithms, they get into the data collection, uh, they get into the design of these systems. Um, and so key to all of this is, first of all, uh, you know, check your biases. Do not assume that if it's an automated system, clearly it's looking at things objectively. Um, and also, key, and you've heard reference to this by both panels, the idea of having um, all of the disabled voices in the room, not just testing on, you know, you know, three weeks before you're about to deploy it, but are they there at the conceptualization, at the design, at the development, at the testing, um, and at all phases. So many of the errors we have in technologies that haven't been inclusive is because there were no underserved voices in the room to catch it early. So that's a, you know, a critical component in ensuring that these things are built in, in a fair way. So I wanna add that if you've ever hung out with engineers for a long time, um, living and working around engineers, they are a grossly diverse group of people who want to do ethically smart and challenging things. And so when I think of all of the engineers that I know, they do something that I think Google has a policy, it's called the ethical promise. And so lifting up, and I was searching for the actual language because I wanted to look at the language really critically and like code it. <laughs> um, but I wanted to look at the major players that have been the, at the leading forefront of AI and to look at their ethical promises because at the root of all this technology, we're human. And so I love the idea that we're only as good as us checking our biases. And so it's gravely important that we don't have the few setting the regulation because we know they don't rep represent the many. And so for us to be really keenly and acutely aware of that is very important. Just a, state, a statement we have at Google, I mean, and it's not just Google, the disability community in general, the nothing about us without us, yeah. they added at Google, and nothing without us at all and also the idea of not building for people with disabilities, but building with and for people with disabilities. I thought you were gonna jump in, so I just. <laughs> no, I just I, love that point about looking at what's, and what is available and transparent. You know, all the major companies have ethical standards. Um, they also have blueprints and guidance for regulatory process. These are great places. You asked a great question about like, where do I start? What do I look at? And I think looking at the tools and what companies and corporations are offering, looking at the regulatory blueprints and figuring out what's missing and what you want to uplift is really helpful. 
Yeah, I think it's critical. I mean, and we've talked a lot about the regulatory issues. Uh, Trey, I think, brought up the executive order uh, just in the last panel. I mean, there's a, there's a lot that this is going to transform. What are some issues, I mean, that we have to be thinking about as a society that, or as leaders and civic leaders, education leaders here in the room, uh, what are some things that we should just be thinking about generally as we kind of go forward and leave the room here? And I think we've got about two minutes left to answer this question, so. so I'll give a quick answer. The two things that I think about a lot are the reality that the large language models reflect the world as it is. And the world as it is, is full of racism, sexism, and ableism. So as we're implementing technology, there's a baseline that we have to correct for. Um, the second part that I've referenced before, but I think a lot about, is the challenge between rights and protections, and how do we make sure that a positive use case around accessibility is not blocked by regulations that intend to protect another part of our civil rights frame. And it's going to be an ongoing conversation. I mean, I think also there has been reference to the, um, to the fact that we're going to need to come up with different ways, we've discussed this internally, of evaluating what is knowledge, what is competency, um, because as AI is able to do more and more, uh, there is such a thing as competency, but its measurement is going to be different, how we define it is different, and so on. So I think that's a challenge for the future. So as a special education director, I have to break the law every day. I am constantly with one law I have to break or another. And I'm constantly making a decision. Do I turn this device on and break the law of, let's say, access, or do I keep it off and not give it to this one? So constantly, there's, there's duality in what I'm doing. There's a ton of laws that don't fit together in the same landscape. And when our lawmakers were making the laws, they never thought that this law was actually preventing another area or subpopulation from having their rights served. And so you have to be very mindful of that as a leader. And I go to the, my boss every day and say, which one of these laws would you want me to break? Because a decision's going to break one. And we'll talk to legal and say, well, which one's more expensive? Or how can we get around? Or are the stakeholders at the table? And do we have any other solutions? Um, but that is just the current reality of what we where we're living. I think the bigger part of this is, um, looking at the landscape for people with learning disabilities, you know, every time I go a little higher up in a, a different, like, echelon, there's less. And so in K-12 landscape, we have, you know, 20, 40, 50 percent maybe, I don't know, depending on what diagram you're looking at, of kids with learning needs. Then when you get to college the first time, maybe 10 percent of all graduates have learning disabilities. When you get into graduate work, maybe you have less than 1 percent. When you get to a PhD, you're less than like part of a percent. And so when you're looking at a society that has a workforce of knowledgeable people that either like Amy wasn't welcome to come out and share about that because he wanted to get tenure and promotion. It is a huge problem. And so what I feel like we need to do is really go back down to the K-12 sector. So if we, if we fundamentally get that right, those students understanding and knowing their rights will end up adults. And so we really have to retool the K-12 systems and laws so that those individuals coming up with all of your guidance, they will be empowered advocates so that when they go out into the world, they can actually lead all of us a whole lot better and have their voices heard at a greater capacity. Thank you so very much. Thank you, everyone. And, and <clears throat> as um, <clears throat> NCLD's unofficial lawyer, I just want to point out Dr. Grillo was speaking in theory about breaking laws. That was a hypothetical for any recordings that were going on. That was a hypothetical that she was speaking of because there are no laws that are intentionally ever being broken by our STEAM panelists. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. Rylan, I want to encourage you with your work to also make sure you tap into that new infrastructure bill and every single aspect of it that will impact on the differently abled community. Let's give a nice round of applause to our panelists.